Hello, everyone. Been a while since I've been on here. Hope everyone's doing fine. Hope everyone's being safe. Hope everyone's not going nuts over all this COVID-19 stuff. And uh, I hope everyone is uh, uh, staying clear of it. And I hope at the same time that you're able to entertain yourself. <laughs> That's pretty much what we got to do when we're in this situation, right? Well, anyway, I thought I'd tell you today about my first job. Actually, my first two jobs. I was raised up in a home that my father thought after the eighth grade that you had all the inner education that you needed. And so that's as far as I went in school. It wasn't until years later that I went ahead and got more education, but that's neither here nor there. What I had to do was find a job. And at 15 years of age, that's kind of hard to do. So back then, I don't know what they do today. It's been so many years since I've done that, so I don't even know if they got them today. But back then, they had what was called an unemployment office. You'd go down to the unemployment office, and you'd tell them who you are and tell them, that you're wanting a job and blah, blah, blah. Well, I went down to the unemployment office and the guy told me, he said, hey, we don't have nothing. I said, okay. Next day I went back down there and he said, hey, we don't have nothing. This went on for about three weeks. And finally he said, I keep telling you every day we don't have anything. I said, I know, but that was yesterday. You might have something today. So about three or four days later, he said, I got a job. I said, all right. He said, can you drive? I said, well, yeah, I'm driving. I've got a driver's license. He said, okay. He said, uh, lumber company over here needs somebody to deliver. I said, all right, I'll go over there. So I went over to the lumber company and the guy told me, he said, uh, I only pay minimum wage. And I said, that's all right. That's okay. By the way, minimum wage back then was 65 cents an hour. <laughs> And so I went to work with this man, making deliveries for him. And after about two weeks, I went in and he said, Mr. He says, you do an excellent job. He said, I'm going to give you a dollar raise. Just like that, I went from 65 cents an hour to a dollar 65. And uh, I got along great with that man. I mean, we, I'd make all, I'd make, deliveries and make deliveries and then one day he come to me and asked me he said can you drive a truck I said I can drive anything got four wheels or more so he took me back and showed me this big truck and he said I want you to take this big box truck and I want you to go to St. Louis and I want you to pick up a load of lumber I said okie dokie so that's what I did I got along great with him then one day he had a heart attack died, that was the end of the lumber company. So here I was, out of a job. And I went along there for about th two or three months. I had put in applications every place under the sun. Every place. And I come in one, one Monday morning, I got up and I come in and sat down at the breakfast table and my dad said, what's wrong? I said, you seem down. I said, can't get a job nowhere. He said, well, I said, I, now before you ask, I put in applications everywhere in the world I can think of. And I said, I can't, I can't find a job. He said, well, I'll tell you what let's do. Let's pray about it. I said, a job? He said, yeah. I said, you, you, want, you want to pray about me getting a job? God's interested in me getting a job? He said, well, let's see. So we went off in his office and we knelt down and we prayed about me getting a job. Next morning, next morning, Tuesday morning, he come in there about 10 minutes till seven and he said, you up? I said, well, I'm just waking up. He said, well, get up. 
get dressed. You got an, an interview. And I said, I got an interview. Yeah, at eight o'clock. I said, where at? He said, Come, the, the Sherman Community Hospital. So I went over to Sherman Community Hospital, had to be there at eight o'clock. And this director of nursing says, uh, the position we've got open is called a surgeon's orderly. And I'll explain to you what all you do, and today you'll be observing. I said, I said okay, that'll be fine. And so, they took me up to where surgery was, and they said, the first thing you got to do is learn how to scrub in. Well, I always thought I had washed my hands, but, buddy, I hadn't done nothing compared to what they do. And so they got me all scrubbed in. This girl comes over there, and she's got a gown on. Her. She said, put your arms in here. And I put my arms in there. She went around to the back. She tied it up. Another one come over and put gloves on my hand. She took me in and she, and when I walked in there, there was eleven other people. So go over and stand against that wall with the rest of them. Said, "All you're going to do is observe today." I said, "Oh, okay." So I went over there. I didn't know them guys, and so I went over there and I stood, and they brought in. They brought in this woman. Son, I'm gonna tell you, if she if she didn't weigh four hundred pounds, she didn't weigh a pound. I mean she was a big. And they laid her out on that table and got her to sleep and all that stuff. And then here come here come this surgeon and he was just a bebopping in there. I mean he was an old man, but he just he just shook his legs back and forth, back and forth, uh, and uh, not moving his feet. And, and, and in a few minutes, he said, turn on the music. And the nurse turned on some music. And he said, hand me a scalpel. Boy, I mean, they laid that woman. They just sliced her from one end to the other. About three guys down on the other end, they fell out. I mean, they, they, they couldn't wait to get out of there. They were going puked all over the place. And so they got out of there. And so we watched all of that for the whole day. At the end of the whole day, I was the only one still in there. Now, back then, whenever they operated on somebody, the way they collected the blood and the water and the stuff was in a bucket underneath the operating table. And whenever a bucket would fill up, you would go over, that's me, I'd go over there, I'd pull that bucket out, I'd put another bucket under there, and I'd go into that bucket. So at the end of the day, the, the, the director of nursing said, well, you think you can handle it? And I said, yep, I can handle it. And she said, it won't, you don't think it'll bother you? I said, nope. Nope, it won't bother me. And uh, she said, well, then be here at 7 o'clock in the morning and go to work. I said, all right. So I went over there, and I went to work. I started out at uh, $150 a month. Got paid twice a month. And I found out that I did things I never thought I would do, and I'm not going to talk about all of them here, but I'm telling you, I learned to do a lot of things I didn't think I'd ever have to do. But it was a good job. I kept that job for about, I guess, uh, well, almost three years ago then, I went to service. And uh, they told me, they said, whenever you get out, you come right back here, you got a job. I said, thank you very much. I appreciate that. 
Of course, when I got out of the service, I ended up going into ministry, and that was that. That was the end of all that. And uh, uh, and the rest is history. But uh, that's how I got my first two jobs. That's how I... I, uh, uh, I will tell you one little story. Uh, I'd been working at the hospital for about six months. Well, when I went to work there, I come out, I told my dad, I said, I got the job, be starting at seven o'clock in the morning. He said, well, I can't be driving you back and forth to work every day. He said, so we got to go get you a car. And he said, JB, he's got a car for sale. He's going into service. He wants to sell his car. I said, well, okay. So we went out to, to JB Styles. His family was members of our church. And, and uh, we went out and we knocked on the door and JB came to the door. And Dad said, I hear you want to sell a car. He said, well, yeah, yeah, I am. He said, well, how much you want for it? Well, preacher, I'm not going to charge you what I'm wanting for it. He said, well, how much, how much will you charge me? He said, I charge you $300. And it was a 1953 hard shell Chevy Bel Air. And he said, there you go, right there. And uh, he said, uh, but you ought to try it out first. And Dad said, well, you, you take him and, and y'all go try it out. Well, we got in the car and there was one thing about the car I didn't know a thing about, and that was stick shift. And that's what his car was. So I said, well, I've never done one of these before. He said, I'll show you how to do it. He said, we'll go to the end of the road and you can come back. I said, all right. So we went to the end of the, of the road there and uh, turned around. I got over there. and By the time we got back, I was able to drive a stick shift. So my dad told me, he said, follow me down to the bank. He said, we've got to get the money for it. I said, okay. So he, he wrote JB a check and we went down to the bank, went into the president's office, Mr. Gray, and, and Mr. Gray said, preach, what can I do for you? He said, my boy needs a car. I said, he's got him a job over to the Sherman Community Hospital, and we, we need to get him some transportation. He said, well, he said, all right. How much you need? He said, $300. He said, I'll co-sign. Well, Mr. Gray said, go to secretary and go get me the paperwork. And he brought the paperwork back in and had it all filled out. And he laid it down there and he said, uh, he said, JD, you sign right there. And so I signed and Then my dad said, where do I sign? He said, you don't sign it. This is between me and him. He wanted to borrow, he needed to borrow $300. If I trust you for a hundred thousand, he said, I can trust him for three hundred, can you? My dad said, Well, I reckon you can. He said, Well, then that's all right then. And he said, You'll make the payments, won't you, son? I said, Yes, sir. I'll make the payments. He said, All right then. Enjoy your car. My dad said, Give me the money. I just paid it. <laughs> I had to give him the three hundred dollars. And so, uh, I said, well, I said, uh, uh, I said, I can, uh, uh, I can probably pay this off in two or three months. And he said, no, he said, don't do that. He said, you've got a year. He said, make the yearly payments and make, pay it off, say, like a, a month early. That'll make your credit good. And I said, well, whatever. I said, okay. So anyway, I was going to tell you the story about after I've been there about six months. I was driving home. From Sherman to Denison, Texas was 10 miles. And uh, actually, the, the, the city limit sign for Sherman and Denison was on the same pole. You'd, you'd drive from Denison, you'd see, a, you'd see city limit sign said Sherman, Texas. Then you'd pass it, you look back, and the city limit sign for Denison was on the same boat. So anyway, I was driving down this thing, and I looked over, 
And here come a car coming lickety split. Looked like it was going 100 miles an hour. I mean, it was moving down the lane. And all of a sudden, that car went off of the road and hit a humongous tree. The back end of that car flipped way up and flipped way down. And it just wrapped around that tree. Well, I pulled over and, and pulled over in the median and I jumped out. A patrol car was coming and I ran over and ran around to the, to the other side of the car from the road. And there was this girl and she, the, the uh, passenger door had flew open and she was laying out with her, with her leg, legs still up in the car, but the rest of her was laying out on the ground. And she had a gash in her leg coming across her knee. And I mean, it, it had just sliced through her leg. And it was just, I mean, you couldn't have saved it. So anyway, uh, so patrolman come up and uh, uh, and I said uh, uh, she tried to say something, but I said I think she died. And so he checked her out, and she took a deep breath and opened her eyes and looked at us. And then she closed her eyes, and that was the end of it. But about that time, I heard a whimper. I thought, what in the world is that? He said, I don't know. Well, then we heard it again, but it was a little louder. And I said, there's a baby somewhere here. And we looked in the car, and there was no baby in the front seat. We looked in the back seat, couldn't see no baby, because we are just looking through the window. And so I went around to the other side, the driver's side of the car, and I looked in, and down in the floorboard on, on the passenger side, was this baby. She wasn't in no car seat. She wasn't in nothing. She was just in laying in the floor. And uh, I said, there's a baby in here. We got to get that baby. And I said, uh, so we tried to open the door. The door didn't want to open. And so I told him, I said, now listen, let's break this window. I said, but let's break the front window. And he said, break the front window. I said, yeah, break the front window. Then we'll roll the back window down and get the door open. He said, well, all right. So that we broke the front window, reached in there, because we couldn't open the back door either. And we, op and, and we rolled that window down. And I told him, I said, now, you just stand back. I'm going to yank this door open. He said, okay, and I reached in there, grabbed a the hold of that door, and I pulled, and I yanked that door right off that car. He said, my Lord in heaven. I said, well, don't, don't, don't worry about that. Let's get that baby. So we got in there and got that baby out. Then we looked in the car, and in the visor was a note. And this woman meant to kill herself and kill the baby. Because she had been beaten and beaten and beaten and beaten and beaten by her husband. And she couldn't take it no more. That was the first time I ever ended up on TV. There was somehow somebody had gotten a hold of the television station. It was just right down the road anyway. And they had taken a picture of me t getting that the car door open, getting in there and getting that baby. And uh, uh, and so that was my debut on television. And uh, whatever happened to that baby, I don't know. But I'm sure that probably some family member got it. Uh, I just don't know what happened to that. But anyway, that's a little story about my second job and, and some of the things that happened while I was doing it. Uh, I, enjoyed, I enjoyed that job. I had a lot of fun doing that job. And uh, uh, I don't know what to say now, except that I'm smoking what you call a Peterson wannabe.
It's got the same system in it as the Peterson. Got the P lift, and I'm smoking some some uh, uh, Sir Walter Raleigh in it. Somebody sent me, I can't remember who it was now, sent me some tobacco, and they sent me a package of Sir Walter Raleigh, said everybody ought to have at least one package of Sir Walter Raleigh laying around. Well, nearly 58 years ago, I had tried Sir Walter Raleigh, and I didn't like it. But you know, I tried it this time. You know, your taste changed over the years. And so I tried it this time, and I liked it. I'm enjoying it. You know, I, 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 want, you, I want you people to know I've been praying for you. Been praying for you because of all of this uh, coronavirus thing. And uh, I've been praying that all of you would be safe, praying that all of you would be careful. And uh, now I'm not going to tell you that every time you walk out the door, you ought to wear a mask. Uh, somebody asked me the other day, said, where's your mask? I said, I'm not going to try to rob nobody. I'm just here to get some. But I want you to know I have been praying for you, and I hope that everybody is doing well. I pray that the good Lord will watch over you, the good Lord will protect you, the good Lord will supply you every need, take care of every circumstance in your life. And until I see you again, I guess it's bye-bye.